Welcome to the best of everything. I am Ruben Paul, and I'm very excited today. Uh, not because Johnny is here, but because one of my best friends in the business oh, is okay. here. Uh, I've known this guy for a long time. You guys uh, know him and love him. You might recognize him from Last Comic Standing, his uh, com uh, Showtime special. Am he currently has an Amazon special out right now. The very funny, the very talented, the uh, uh, typecast security guard of everything <laughs> we've been on. <laughs> the one and only, the great Alonzo Bowden. Yeah. What is up? What's up, Rue? What's up, Johnny? What's hey, up? man. So it is great to see you, man. I haven't seen you since everything shut down. Dude. Yeah, I think I think we saw each other the last weekend. I know I saw Johnny the last show I did at the factory at, in Long Beach. Yeah. Right, Johnny? Yeah, yes. on that. And I don't I, know. I if I you. <laughs> did I see you that night, Ruben? I don't know. That was what, March? 14th. 14th. No, yeah. I, I, I was out of town, but I bet your ass ain't complaining about going to Long Beach now, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went down after it got hit. I went down the day after just to see what it looked like. And I don't know if you guys went down there, but no. it, I'll tell you what was, and I posted a picture of this. It was really uh -huh. weird. There was a soldier standing outside of the Laugh Factory and it just felt wrong. You know what I mean? It was mm. it, it it was just a lone guy. I asked him, could I take his picture? You know, I didn't want to get shot taking his picture, but <laughs> he said, yeah. But it was a really weird vibe to see a soldier standing in front of the Long Beach Laugh Factory. You know, that was uh yeah, that was not cool. Not cool. Not on wow. his part, just in general, you know. And this was during the uh, the protests, right? You went yeah, this there. was this. So oh. if, the protests, if the big yeah. protests were Saturday, and then Long Beach got hit Sunday night, and this gotcha. was Monday afternoon, I was out there Monday, so I went by. Wow. You know, you know what's interesting about that last show on March 14th, Alonzo was. I I did that show. I came back to uh, my uh, out here in West Hollywood, and I went over to to. Uh, the Hollywood uh, Laugh Factory um, to hang out, kind of hung out with Godfrey and, and some of the other companies. And that was when everybody was like, oh, that's it's spreading. It's around, you know, the whole thing with the, with the coronavirus. And I remember I hung out and I was outside and I was talking to Godfrey and the girl Liz, the photographer. And I was like, you know, maybe I should go to the, the den will be packed. It's a Saturday night, but it's not going to be that big of a deal, right? As I started to walk, I got to the that gas station on the corner of Crescent and Sunset, and I went, you know, maybe I should not go to the den. <laughs> and I turned around and went back to my place, and it was like literally the quarantine hit just a couple days later, you know? And I always kind of wonder what that voice or instinct was, uh, because, you know, the... The den was was always standing room only on Saturday nights, Friday and Saturday yeah. nights. So, you know, but something, uh, but it, it was just what a weird, what a transition that happened so quickly from us working, hearing about it on cruise ships. And I remember thinking about all the cruise ship comics, like, oh, man, they're going to be out of work, man. You know, but not even thinking it would affect us the way that it ended up that quickly, by the way. Yeah. It, it, well, when the quarantine started six years ago, right? Because <laughs> time has no meaning anymore, right? <laughs> I mean, this is the example I use. Remember Tiger King? Yes. How long ago does yeah. that feel? Yeah. That was three months ago. That was the number one show in the world. That feels like oh. he should be getting out now. That's how long ago. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Time, but but I remember that, and and I remember I flew home. I was supposed to do a cruise that weekend, and I oh. flew I flew to Miami that Friday, right Friday the thirteenth. We got yeah. off the plane, and we got the messages the cruise was canceled. So I got back on a plane, came back home, and I booked a bunch of Laugh Factory spots because I was like, oh well, I'm going to be home all week. There's no cruise, yeah. and then. Well, we worked Saturday and then Sunday, everything closed, right? And it's and it's pretty much been closed since. And 
yeah, it was really weird. Because like you said, Johnny, that Saturday night, we didn't think that this is going to be the last night we work <laughs> until whenever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Speaking Man, of which, I, I ain't got my check yet from that <laughs> side. <laughs> my office ain't open. What the hell? My, I, was, I was in Minnesota at the, oh, house of, at the House of Comedy. Oh, and, that's right. And uh, they were deba debating whether they were going to cancel that show. Mm. Then we had enough tickets sold. That's when the hysteria was starting. Uh, to build, but all of us have hit the road hard in our careers from time to time. But Zoe, I, I consider you a, a road warrior, and I know you like being gone. How's it been for you <laughs> and, <laughs> and be in LA? Because for you guys listening, Alonzo is always gone. If he's not doing clubs, he's doing corporates, he's not doing corporates, he's doing cruise ships. If he's not doing cruise ships, he's performing in his backyard. I mean, he's doing. <laughs> Yeah, I, listen, I'll be the first to admit I'm a workaholic. I don't know what, to, I don't know how to not work, right? And when it comes to travel, you know, I go to the airport now just to let the TSA guys rub against me, just for old times' sake. Like, there's no, just, just, just check me, guys, just for, you know. It, it's been, uh, you, you, there's a few things that I've noticed that are really different, right? Um, like everybody, I'm doing the Zoom shows and the podcasts and this and that. Well, now we work during the day instead of working at night. Yeah, that, yeah. That that's mm. weird. Like like staying up. Like I still don't go to sleep. You know, early. Like I still live on a comic yeah. schedule. But but the idea of hitting the stage at midnight on a Friday, like I'm gonna have to get conditioned to that again because. Yeah. And I didn't want to get used to being home. I off off air. I uh, Johnny, I was telling Ruben, I just bought a new TV just because. Like I watch <laughs> it all the time, and the last thing I want to do is get comfortable being home watching TV. You know, I ain't got oh, that kind of money. You know, I, have, I have friends with syndication money. They can yeah, stay. Yeah. Home. They ain't worried about work. I ain't got no syndication money. You know. <laughs> um, so that it it is weird being home and the experience I was going to tell you about Ruth. So last week I got booked to do a show. They were doing a tournament in Vegas called the 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 five tournament. Oh, okay, that's when you drove down there, right? Right, three on three basketball tournament. Um, replace the big three, and they're in a bubble. They were all at this hotel called the Artisan, and they're playing the games at the Orleans, and they're all basically a small version of the NBA, right? They're locked in. So they, they said, come in, do a show. They told me, if you want to stay overnight, you got to get tested. Otherwise, you just come in, do the show, and leave. So they set up the show out by the pool. And it I don't know, 20 guys, you know, ball ex-ball players. All these guys had played in the NBA. The only big names I recognized were Mike Bibby and Mario Chalmers. But they, everybody there was in the league. So they're just hanging out by the pool, you know, and sitting in the cabanas. So, man, I went up there, I tried material, you know, 10 minutes in, it was like, okay, this ain't going to work because the situation just wasn't conducive. So now I'm going to walk around the pool with my cordless mic and just fuck with the guys, right? But I was so rusty, I didn't have anything <laughs> to say. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, yeah, where did you play? Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, I've been there. I've been there. <laughs> and, <laughs> And Bad I feel like one. in my head, in my head, I'm dying a horrible death, right? Now these yeah. guys, they were cool. They knew they were like, man, I feel for you. You in it, you know, they're like, <laughs> we're just glad to have something to break the monotony. But you know, it, I might have hit I was batting about 300 that night. Now you guys know I'm generally <laughs> batting about seven, eight hundred. You know what I'm saying? I'm, Almost I'm, a thousand, probably a thousand. I've always told people. Ruben. <laughs> I was, I was lucky to bat 300. Every time they laughed, I wanted to just leave. Like, okay, <laughs> crap, I'm going home. And and again, they were cool as hell. But what I realized was, this online shit is not the same. Like like yeah. I'm rusty. I'm I'm super rusty. You know what I mean? Like I know how to do, and and it's another thing. I've learned how to do Zoom comedy, right? We were talking about this. Mm -hmm. I think we've all learned how to do this now, but I don't want this to be the new normal. No. You know, 
Cool. Yeah. So, but oh, Johnny, well, it was, oh, let me tell you, you talk about spending the night, man. I left a trail of smoke getting the hell out of there. I was like, man, I can't be seen ever again. <laughs> yo, yo, well, the, the thought of you doing crowd, crowd work is hilarious to me. <laughs> oh, oh, it was, it was. And, the, and Al Alonzo, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. You, am I coming in all right? Are you guys hearing me okay? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I, Ruben knows this, man. I just wanna, I wanna jump back for just a quick second. I, I, Ruben, how many times have I told you when we talk the next day after our sets, and I'll go, you go, Ruben's like, who's on the show? Who's on your show? You know. And if you were on the show, I've said this to Ruben so many times. I go, damn, Rube, has Alonzo ever had a bad set? Like, <laughs> I just apparently now, but even that wasn't bad. It's just like Ruben. How many times have I? I was like. This dude is like, even if the crowd has been weird with, for everybody else, you were always a comic going, all right, look, here's what we're going to do. I don't like the way you guys are at. And then it just, the whole room gets shifted. And I've always said this through, I go, man, Alonzo, man, Ken. And, and by the way, Alonzo, so everybody knows what a road dog he, he is. Um, Alonzo's the guy who told me, you said this years ago. You said, I was like, damn, man, you were out of the road again and i remember you going well in order to uh afford to live in la i have to be out of la yeah <laughs> i don't know if you remember telling me that and i was like oh interesting but just so everybody understands i had met uh alonzo early on in my open mic days we were obviously both open micers but he'd only been doing it a few years as well but this shows what a pro he was he had, he had bought ruben i think i told you this and i felt like we had already had you on, Alonzo. I had to, I had to text <laughs> Ruben because we've had so many conversations in the booth upstairs at the Hollywood Laugh Factory with you that I felt like you had already been on our show once or twice already. You know what I mean? On our <laughs> podcast. But I have to always bring up, I know you get tired of it, but I have to always bring up you buying the Mitsubishi Eclipse just so you could go do the road. He was driving to Arizona, <laughs> New Mexico, Texas. I don't know how far you went, but I remember Alonzo going, I just got this new car. It was a brand new Mitsubishi Eclipse. And that night at that show, the, the guy who ran it uh, said it was a bar. It was a bar show. I think Bob mm. Zaney might've been on the lineup with us. And uh, I just remember that guy going, hey man, guys, send, send me a package, which you know was a VHS tape. Yeah. And your head shot in a resume, right? Of course, the rest of us are like, yeah, no problem. Alonzo goes, hold on. He walked outside to the <laughs> trunk of his Mitsubishi Eclipse. He had a shitload of them. And he walked back in with the manila envelope, with the VHS, his head shot, his resume. He goes, there you go. And I remember that guy going, now that's how you do it, guys. That's how you do it. <laughs> See what he just did? He has and he's everything been, right. And he's been working ever since. <laughs> well, no, you know, I learned that, right? I learned that. I right. I'm trying to remember the guy's name. He used to book Rascals in New Jersey. He's a brother. Oh, 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 oh. Tony Camacho. Tony Camacho. Oh, so, man. Damn. When I, I first recently. started, when I first started, right, I was opening for uh, Bill Bellamy at Rascals. And I remember Tony told me, he said, yo, man. You need a reliable car. He said, if you're going to be an opener of feature, he said, you can't never, you can't not make the gig. You know what yeah. I mean? He was like, yeah. the headliner can have a problem. You can't. He said, mm. get a reliable car. And I had a friend who had a car dealership and he hooked me up with that car. And I got, <laughs> that. seriously, I, I got yeah. that thing and I was ready to go. And as far as having a package, you know who <laughs> taught me about having a package? Shang. Oh, yes. of course. Who worked? Um, you would go to a one nighter on the first night it opened, and Shang's picture was already on the wall. You're like, how did he already work here? Yes. <laughs> but Shang told me he's he's like, yeah, man, you got to be ready. Mm. He said these things come and go, and if you remember, he had that notebook. He had like every one nighter in America listed. Everyone, everyone. But, but yeah, it, so 
he taught me that. He said, yeah, man, you got to be ready. When they ask for a tape, boom, I got a tape. They want a headshot, boom, I got a picture. You know, that was, yeah, that, I learned that, man. I learned that, from the road dogs. That, you know, the, and, the and hence, dogs. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Johnny. And, and hence, uh, Ruben will know this. I'm surprised he hasn't asked me already. Johnny, did you end up mailing that guy a package? No, of course I didn't. <laughs> of course, That's I was my career. You didn't. I, I know you would. I know you did. But <laughs> let me just let me just say this about Shang real quick. Shang was social media doing social media. His flyers were everywhere. <laughs> every open mic, every comedy. I would see his photo. I always thought he was more of like a spoken word guy in the beginning. Remember when Shang was sort of like. He had that spoken word vibe. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I mean, okay. he, he, yeah. Shang, Shang fell under the umbrella of conscious comedy during the That's, black comedy explosion. Yeah. He was known yeah. Yeah. as mm -hmm. a conscious guy. But one thing I can say about Shang, any comic who ever knows him has a similar Alonzo story because Shang has always had a packet. He's always known all the book <laughs> Whether it be one nighters. Now, when Shane gives you a list, you you got to double and triple check it because those na those names and numbers could be from eighty seven. So, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, hey, why are all these email addresses have AOL at the end of them? <laughs> <laughs> but Shang has always and, been and, and a self submit too. self sufficient and a self promoter, man. And, and I, I've and, always and, been for that. Yeah, and Ruben, remember not long, long ago, just about a month or so ago, when when or a little further than that, two months ago, when these Zoom comedy things were starting, who was the first? I remember I sent one to you. I go, look who's on this lineup. Shang, yeah. of course, yeah. immediately. <laughs> Even when they started, he was already on it with a flyer. I mean, unbelievable. And, but Alonzo's just been so, so amazing about that, man. I mean, just such a hard worker. So this has been obviously hard for you as well. This has got, it has to have been the longest you've ever gone and not physically being up on stage on a regular basis. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I got up on July 3rd um, and, and La Jolla at the La Jolla comedy store. My boy was doing it and I went down and I just went just cause the club was open and he was up. Like I didn't plan on going up. I just went just to feel a comedy club, you know? And he said, man, do 10 as a guest spot. And it was it was literally like being in the desert and getting a, getting a glass of water. It was the most, like just the yeah. feel. There was like 30 people there or something. And they were into it. You know, they were happy just to to mm -hmm. be at a show. But the, yeah. the feel of doing live. So I'm going to Florida in a couple of weeks, right? People are like, oh, you're crazy going to Florida. I'm like, we got the same numbers in California. What the hell? And what, what um, problem, what problem will you be working for? Five quarters in Tampa. Ah, yeah. Yes. And then, uh, you know, they, they cut the attendance in half and and this or that. It, it's, I think, side splitters. I know some people who've done the Tampa improv, and mm -hmm. I think side splitters is better because it's a it's its own club, you know what I mean? Like, it's not in the middle of the, the little entertainment mall thing, like improvs always are, you know, because. Yeah. Efron went to yeah. Tampa and he said he put on a mask and they started calling him a pussy, you know, which is stupid, yeah. but it is what it is. <laughs> but I, um, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to do yeah. St. Louis at the end of August, helium. Okay. And well, well, let me ask you, let me ask you, so are you conflicted at all? This is not to be on the spot, but I've had these conversations with, other comics who are slowly getting back out there. Are you conflicted with, you know, being a comic and wanting to perform and do the shows? And then also, do you, some people feel like by you showing up, are you putting people in danger by coming to the shows? No, I don't think I'm putting them in danger. Um, there is a risk, but I think what's going on with everyone in our society is it's a calculated risk. <laughs> It's a calculation between how much you want to work, how safe it is or isn't, you know, like, like the guys, who was it? Uh, Eddie, if was it, or 
who was it who went to Texas and got sick? Um, DL. Was it Eddie or DL Hughley? No, DL was in Tennessee. But a well, couple well, of guys, that's where he passed out. But he he contracted it in in Texas at yeah. at, at the uh, uh, Arlington Improv, I believe. Yeah. Well, I don't remember right. who it was, but it was two comics. But they said afterwards, they said, well, we were idiots because we didn't wear masks. We didn't take it seriously. We were shaking hands, doing pictures, and mm -hmm. they both got sick. So, I mean, I'm not going to do something like that. I think being on stage is a natural social distance barrier, right? Yeah. And, and um, I'm going to bring my own mic for what that's worth. And, you know, like when I was in La Jolla, we wear our masks off stage. <clears throat> I think the the flight being on the airplane seems to me more risky because I have no control over that. I think I have control when I'm in the club yeah, over my distance yeah. and my encounters. Yeah. I mean, it's not like I'm going to be slinging merch after the show. You know what I mean? But exactly. um, but when you're on the plane, you have no, no control over that. Well, you just need to make just enough money to pay for that new TV you got. So I know why you're going. And <laughs> That's the other thing, you know, this is the other thing that kind of sucks. They're cutting money, right? Oh, of course. So of course. I told my agent, I said, <laughs> clubs that I have a relationship with that I trust the, the people running them, I don't mind doing that. But other clubs, I'm not going for low money because the moment you do, they're going to be like, well, that's your new club. Yeah. You know what I mean? That So I don't want to get yep. into that. And then what other people were talking about, like like Rogan did um, Houston Improv, right? Which is like a 600 seat, big, big ass club. But, you know, if Rogan's are doing clubs, then we ain't going to get shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Rogan's an arena guy. So if the arena people are doing clubs, it's going to be a hustle. We, we're going to be struggling out here. But, I, but yeah. it is what it is, man. I, I you know... Well, I, 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 I think this is though, I think a lot of the arena guys are going to work clubs when they feel like it because they still can't make the money that they would make. They they have to want to do it because it's not yeah. a money grab for them, you know. But the hard part is, you know, those guys who are doing arenas, they're going to probably <clears throat> right. until, you know, 2021, if not later, you know, with those large gatherings. Yeah, well, with, with them, it's not about the money. It's just about stage time, right? Like I said, mm -hmm. forget Rusty. But still, yeah. that's going to make stage time harder to get. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. because even at half capacity, if you're running a club and you can get a, you know, um, a big name at half capacity, you're going to take that over one of us, you know. And then and then the 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 levels below us, you know, good luck. I mean, honestly, the features and the openers, I feel for them right now, man, because they've lost their whole summer and this and that. You know, if, you're, if you're the $500 a week feature, this is your life, man. I don't I don't know what their hustle is going to be, you know? Yeah. And listen to, that, listen to that. $500 a week feature. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. It used to yeah. be seven, you know what yeah. I mean, if you did seven shows. So it's crazy that that They've gone down, and the features used to depend a lot on. Hey, there's, there's eight. There's eight. Yeah, well, there's eight hundred dollar well, a week headliners before this even hit. Mm. Yeah, there were eight hundred dollars a week headliners even before this all hit. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, I mean, Can you just, hear me? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> you know we're all we're well, all. I'm gonna, check out. I'm gonna check right. out and check back in. Okay. I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna check out and check. Okay. Yeah, um, we're we're all on a, we're all hustling right now, right? Yeah, that's just the way it's gonna be for a minute, you know. So during like during this shutdown for you, like we we already addressed how difficult it might be. Have you what have you been doing to pass the time besides you know working on the house? Have you been able to find other creative outlets? Are you still doing your your podcast? What was the name of the podcast I, you're doing? Yeah, who's paying attention? Who's paying attention? You had another but, one that I, that I like. Uh, the Fear Not podcast was great, but we had to stop doing that because that was a studio produced one. Got you. So we we thought we could get back in studio, and obviously that's gone. So I'm not doing that. I'm still doing Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me for NPR. Okay. Um, they sent all of us digital recorders. 
So, <clears throat> excuse me. So what we do is we do it as a Zoom, but we record on our digital recorder and upload that so they have the sound quality at the level they need, you know, for mm -hmm. radio. So that works. Uh, so work-wise, you know, that's what I'm doing. And, and... So how did, I mean, we, we talked about this. Uh, how did the NPR thing come about? How'd you get involved in it? And how do you, uh, and, and how do you like doing it? I love doing it. I love doing it. NPR crowd is, they were a tough crowd to crack. You mm. know, the, the, the public radio crowd is kind of like it. The first year of doing the show, they're like, mm, don't know about this guy. I don't know. But once they like you, they're all in and I'm, I'm in now the way I got that show. Uh, I was with APA and I had this agent there and we didn't get along great, but one thing he did, he got them to come see me. I was doing a show in Chicago and they, the producers, and I didn't know that the producers of wait, wait, were coming to see me. Right. Oh, they were so coming they, specifically to see you. Yeah. Yeah, because they were looking at me as a possible um, panelist. So they came to the show. They liked it. They they called me to come in and do the show. Now, this is what's funny. So Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me is huge, right? Five million listeners a week. Wow. I had never, I had never heard of it, Ruben. Never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, I no never idea. heard of it until you told me about it. <laughs> no idea what it was. <laughs> So, but it worked in my favor. So I go in and it's just a panel of three of us. I was there with, I don't remember who was on my first show. I think Tom Bodette was one and the other, but all I was thinking was, all I got to do is be funnier than them. Like that, you know, you know what I mean? Like as a comic, yeah. I'm just like, oh, this is going to be oh. easy. So they, yeah. they ask the questions and I'm throwing in my jokes and, and answering and this and that, <laughs> doing a panel show. Cause we've all done panels. We know how to do panels. Absolutely. And at the end of the show, the host, Peter, he was like, that's the best first show we've ever seen. But to me, it was like, yeah, well, you just asked me about the news and you want me to make fun of it. Like, I only do that every day. You know yeah. what I mean? It was like <laughs> it was a, perfect, a perfect fit. But the good thing was, and I know you guys have both had this experience, sometimes mm -hmm. it's better to not know what you're going into. I agree. You know, that <laughs> I, way. I, I, uh, yes. You don't over plan. That was my first thought. That was my first thought. Yep. You know, um, my friend Marcus Miller, he's a jazz bass player, right? And he played with Miles Davis. And he said when he was he was playing jingles in New York, like, you know, they used to record jingles for commercials in the morning. And he said he got a phone call and it's like, it's Miles Davis. And he thought it was someone bullshitting him. He's like... Miles Davis ain't calling me, be at the studio, blah. And he went there and it was Miles and he played. And he said, man, if I had had a day to think about that, I'd have been the worst. You know you know what I mean? Like he didn't have any time to think about going yeah. in the studio yeah. with Miles. Was well, the same way. And, and again, we've all done this where, you know, it's better like a, a showcase. Like yep. don't, don't, don't tell, tell me. me. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just put them in the back and let me do my set. Cause the last don't, thing, don't I need, you know, last thing I need to think is, Oh, my whole career rides on this set. And when you're newer, <laughs> you think that. Yeah. Once, yes. once you're an old veteran, then you know, like no matter how good I do, I ain't going to get the job. So I don't give exactly. a shit. Don't, don't matter anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they just see me as a courtesy. <laughs> <laughs> but as hey, a courtesy. Hey, I'm, hey, no. Zo, hey, how, hey, Ruben, how about Ruben. right before you go on, Zo? How about right before you go on? It's like, oh, we already love you, Alonzo. We know what you do already. Like, oh. okay, can I not go up anymore? <laughs> do you know oh. where I get that? that? And I love it. Montreal. Right? Was, say At the that. festival, like, I'm part of the furniture now, and I love it. They, <laughs> they invite me every year. Yeah. That's awesome. Host. Yeah. I come off the bench. <laughs> they, they're like, who can't make it? Oh, we'll plug Alonzo into this, which I love. But I tell him, I'm like, I ain't got nothing new to show you. I was <laughs> nervous. What the hell am I nervous? What, I got something new that ABC hasn't seen me do? I got a set, you know what I mean? Like, it's going to be a new set. But they know who I am. So, I, no, I, I wish I could get nervous about going to the festival. <laughs> I, I, always, I, always thought you, I always thought you going to Montreal 
I was like, damn, man. They love Zoe in Montreal, man. Every year, I'm like, Zoe, you go? Yep, every year. But I will say this. Zoe is one of those people, me and Johnny talk about this all the time, and I always have to give credit when credit is due. You know, Alonzo, I, I can speak for myself, and I'm sure he's done it for many of his friends in the business, always tries to help when he can. And trying to get into to Montreal for me was extremely difficult until I had guys like Alonzo Bowden and Godfrey and Russell Peters and different yeah. people that spoke up in my <clears throat> behalf. And it's unsolicited, you know, which is great where you just run into Alonzo and go, hey, by the way, I, I dropped your name to uh, such and such, such and such. Like, oh man, I really appreciate that. And that's one of the things that um, is great about Zoe because not everybody is like that in this business. So Yeah, but you know, we, it's in particular us three, we're all early 90s, right? We all started at the same, like yeah. we were all miking at the same time. I know I used to do those uh, East <clears throat> LA Mexican mics with Johnny all the time, yeah. right? We yeah. used to do those. And Rube, we used to, you <laughs> and me used to do 1 a.m. Yeah. at the Laugh Factory Friday. <laughs> right? so, so we all we all came up. And, and it's actually, this is something like... I, Young comics come to me now, right? I'm the old veteran. I'm the old pro. And I tell them, and I wish I had done more of this, but I tell them, you got to build a crew. You got to have a crew of comics, a network that you guys talk together, write together, this and that. So Absolutely. when one of you pops, they pull the other ones up, right? Because we're seeing a lot of comics do that now. And you know who did that and who I always admired for doing that? Aisha Tyler yeah. did that. Yeah. Aisha did that. She when she got her first big break with the soup or whatever, she brought her people in, you know. And Absolutely. um, but but as far as us, man, we're you know, we're old grinders, we're old pros, and yeah, we gotta mention each other and and let each I, other I do, I do have a I do have a bone to pick with you, and Johnny will laugh his ass off of this story. Alonzo calls me one day, he goes, Hey man, what are you doing uh, <laughs> on Saturday? And I go, uh, I think I'm open. He was like, Look. I host this awards banquet every year for, I, I, I don't know if it was, um, I can't remember what the group was. I don't know if they were in, uh, in the Air press Force. Club? Was it huh? the press club? Was it the LA press club thing or? No, it was something, I, I thought it had to do with airplanes or aviation or some, you used to do. Maybe, I don't know. Anyway, Alonzo hosts it every year and I guess they didn't make the announcement that Alonzo wasn't going to be there. To do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I get there and uh, the brother was real cool. Was like, yo, man, uh, we watched your stuff. You're great. Alonzo told us a lot of great things about you, man. We're going to have fun. You know, just so you know, they love Alonzo. I go, man, I love Alonzo too, man. You know, they're like, all right. So they introduce me and all you hear, everybody going, what happened to Alonzo? <laughs> the whole room. The whole room. So, Johnny, what makes it worse, what makes it worse is I'm at a podium. They, don't even, they didn't even have a mic for me to walk around. I'm at a podium. I go, you got to be bullshit. <laughs> they hate me because Alonzo is not here. And I'm stuck at a podium? Are you kidding me? Dude, I was sweating within the first three minutes of my set, man. And I probably didn't get them until like almost eight minutes in. And then, after, and then, then you know, you know, how black people are, they're coming to me like, man, you know, we love Alonzo, but you was good too. You, 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 you was good too. I'm like, oh, thanks. I won't kill myself in the parking lot now. <laughs> no, you, you know who, who killed me? Like that? <laughs> um, Dom Herrera. <laughs> so you know i host that bermuda jfl thing every year right yeah. so one year i got this show and i couldn't go to bermuda and jfl was pissed at me but i couldn't go so dom goes so dom goes on stage and i've been hosting this thing every year for like seven eight years he's like you know alonzo doesn't care about you i mean so <laughs> you got a better offer he was like, fuck Bermuda, he ain't coming. And he told me, he did the first five minutes, he just told them that I wasn't shit, that I didn't care about it. Yeah, but that's, you know, a veteran. That's, that's a veteran's move, you know what I mean, to do that. That's such a veteran's move. Me, yeah. I was just taking it to the face, like, I like Alonzo too, guys. 
<laughs> They're like, fuck you. We're but you know Alonzo. Hey, Ruben. Ruben Alonzo's always been that guy, too. You can drop him off anywhere. You know, I'm gonna get you a basketball player's bubble gig. <laughs> but I mean, but what's great is we've we've all during the years like passed gigs on to, to each other, but that was the one that stood out. It it turned out you know, it turned out well, but it was just one of those gigs where it's like, man, I wish they would have made an announcement that you weren't going to be there because it was like everybody was there to see you. <laughs> but it ended up being a, a cool gig. And um, damn, I can't remember the organization, but you had done it for a while, man. Um, but they ended up being really, really nice. But corporate gigs are tough, man, when you go in and they're expecting one thing and people are eating you know, they're moaning, you know what I mean? It's like, oh! Let me tell you, this is a <laughs> fun one. And I had I had this one happen with Saget at a college. It was University of Central Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Saget tonight. But first. <laughs> <laughs> the Bob first, man. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I love digging out of that hole. Like, you know, yeah. But first. Well, hey, I, well here, here's a good one. Johnny, uh, I won't say the names, but uh, Johnny, I guess, referred some comics to do a gig and it didn't go well. And then you had to hear about it. Remember, Johnny, when you had you had re referred a group to do some military gig and then they all ate it and then they called you afterwards asking. You remember what gig I'm talking about? Oh, Johnny's frozen. Johnny froze for a minute. No, I don't. You remember? Uh, it was yeah, it was, it was three comic. It was a military so show, man. Dang. Ah, uh, Johnny. I, I, it, it, <laughs> I'll tell the story. Johnny. <laughs> Johnny tell book. Uh, remember, it was three comics. Am was, I going it, in and out? Yeah, you are. Yeah, you're you freezing. Um. Johnny? Okay. Well, you uh it was a military gig. Am I freezing? Yeah, you're you're the, you're just I'm on the out again. Oh, he he dropped. But it was a military gig and Johnny uh Johnny referred these three comics and these three comics were um barely above I guess uh <laughs> they're, they're like at feature level for yeah. a corporate okay. gig. Mm -hmm. And uh, they ate it at this gig. And I guess the lady couldn't wait to call Johnny about his referral afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another thing in this business, man, what a lot of people don't realize, and I'm sure you get this all the time, is, you know, when you work off of your reputation, which you work a lot off of your reputation, um, you got to be careful who you refer sometimes because people yeah. will hold that against you. And um, it's always been an honor and a privilege, man, when great comics refer you because it just, you know, they want to maintain the level because you, you know, you could lose a gig if it goes bad. You know what I mean? Well, there was a, uh, there was a guy in Portland who used to do that. If you recommended somebody and he mm -hmm. didn't like them, he wouldn't book you for a year. Like, yep. and, and we were like, man, I can't be responsible for what's, you know? <laughs> yeah. I just, got, I just got told that, uh, I referred somebody to a gig and um, I was referring to Jay Larson, mm -hmm. who's very funny. And they didn't know who Jay Larson was. And then they said, well, you know, if, uh, he doesn't do well, then uh, it's going to affect your bookings. I go, first of all, my track record should be straight. You shouldn't be holding me accountable for somebody else. But I said, I have no doubt whatsoever that he's going to go and kill the room. And then they called me back like, you were right. He was fantastic. How do we not know about him? And I think... I mean, you have talked about this. That's the weird thing about stand-up comedy in general in this business is there's so many great comics, you yeah. know, and you've been great for a long time before you even got last comic standing. And it's amazing how so many of us can go unnoticed or fly under the radar, you know, doing stand-up. Well, it's, it's always been that way. It's always been that way. You know, even the guys from the 80s, right, when they, you know, they were becoming stars, any of them will tell you, and no disrespect to the superstars, right? Mm -hmm. But I remember talking to Dom about this once, and Dom was like, you know, Seinfeld was never the funniest guy on the show. 
You know what I mean? Like if there was a lineup of, of six of them or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and that's no disrespect to Seinfeld. But, but as you know, there's so many other factors involved, right? To become that guy or that woman or to get recognized or to have somebody pluck you from whatever. Like I was talking to Michelle Wolf, right? And she's mm -hmm. cool. I don't know if you know her. She's real cool. I've never met her, but I I I, I like her. I like her. Yeah. Great. And I was surprised she hasn't been doing it that long. She's been doing it right 10 or 11 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. But she said um Chris Rock and Louis C.K. liked her. Like when they saw her do, you know, doing her seller audition or early days, whatever around. And she said, and then, you know, they just started recommending me. I mean, and if you get that recommendation, right, that opens doors. No, and and so she was seen, you know, you, you have to be seen by somebody who makes that decision, right? And that's always been the 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 difficult thing to do. You know, you there are great comics, like you said, they're great. And and I've seen them, I've worked with people, you know, you work with some guy randomly at the Des Moines Funny Bone. <laughs> and, and he's a killer. And you're like, wow. But he doesn't know how to bust out of that Midwest loop or he's comfortable in that or he can't. I would tell him always, they're like, what do you do? I'm like, man, you got to get to a festival. Get to a festival mm -hmm. where the most people can see you in the shortest amount of time and they got to see you live and stuff like that. But those are the kind of breaks, man. You know, this business, is it's hard work, talent, and a lucky break now and then, you know, the, yeah. the right person. And we've seen this. If the right person thinks you're funny, it don't matter how many people think you're not funny. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Absolutely. We've seen that where, where somebody, you know, hell, you've seen it with Saturday Night Live where Lauren Michaels picks somebody and then you see him on a showcase at the improv and you're like, what? Mm -hmm. How did what? You know? Yeah. It is what it is, man. The, one of the things, one of the other things I was taught in this is don't get bitter. Absolutely. Because if you get bitter about, you know, it's not a meritocracy. Merit and work matter, but it's not a full meritocracy. So if you get bitter about it, you're just going to kill yourself. And, we, and we've and we watched people, man. I, I tell people, like, when people talk about Gabe, right, when they talk about Fluffy, yeah. I'm like, man, I, and Johnny, you remember this, back at the old days, what was it, the Bicycle Club? Yeah. And his, yeah. his fat ass would come bouncing in with his shorts <laughs> and his Hawaiian shirt, right, doing a $50 spot, and the whole room fell in love. And you're just like, man, this yeah. guy cannot yeah. be stopped. And, you know, and it wasn't anything – about his writing or his joke, it was him. He just, yeah, just him. this yeah. lovability about him. Absolutely. Right? So, so you could sit there and say, oh man, he blah, blah, blah. Really? Did you see what just happened? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's, you, you touched on something very important, man. I think a lot of it is, is out of our hands and it's, it's, it's timing. Some people call it luck, right place at the right time. And I think to get bitter you do yourself a disservice saying what happened to somebody else can't happen to you. You know, I think we talk about this on the show a lot. There's no statute of limitations on success. You know, if we're all athletes, our careers would be over by now, <laughs> you know, but in comedy, yeah. there's constant, constant examples of people thriving as they get older. I mean, you can just go to Rodney Dangerfield, somebody who had success. Well, late Spoon, John there. Witherspoon. John Spoon Witherspoon. Made it. Spoon made it when he became everyone's dad. You know, yeah. I mean, he was around, he was great. But when he became, and he was everybody's dad. You know yeah. what I mean? He, he was, yeah. there wasn't a, every young comic, he mm. was their dad. Every movie, he was a dad. Yeah. And Spoon became a huge star doing that. So, yeah, yeah you, you know. Yeah. Uh, look, look at you you yeah. got to love doing this shit, right? Because if yeah. you don't love it, it's easy to figure out reasons to not do it. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that, you know, a, another thing that we talk about is, you know, there's people who love comedy and then there's people who like it. And I tend to always bond with the people who love comedy because this is it for us. This is what we're doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is our passion. We enjoy it. And um, 
you'll have uh, different degrees of success during your journey. Uh, but the fact is, you know, this is who we are and this is what, what we do. Uh, I kind of want to uh, touch on um, you. A lot of people don't know this about you, which is funny, is you're from New York. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And but you didn't start stand up until you came to L.A. Right. I, I grew up in New York, but my career, I started in L.A. And the, the real funny thing about it was when I went to New York the first time, to me, that was a test, mm. you know, because I'd been working in L.A. a couple of years. But New York, especially like now, New York is definitely the comedy city. But even yeah. back then, New York is if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. So it mattered to me what New York comics thought of me. You know, am I, am I good enough to crack the city? And I always joke that I know I'm good because Bobby Kelly doesn't hate me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody yeah. hates LA comics more than Bobby. So exactly. Exactly. Bobby doesn't hate me means I'm doing something right. No, yeah. the first time, the first time I went to New York, man, I went to do the Apollo Comedy Hour, right? So I don't know if you ever did this show or if you remember this show. I remember it. Of course. Tony Camacho. Didn't Tony Camacho book that, right? Uh, no, it, was, it wasn't It was Tony who booked me on it. It was a woman. I can't remember who it was. Okay. But, but I remember this. I go to New York. I run into, at the time, Talent and Will Silvins and, and that crew, right? And yeah. they're like, oh, man, we're going to you know, get you ready for your spot. So they're taking me around. Now, this is like 95, I guess when Def Jam is the biggest thing in the world. So I got to work clean because this is TV. This is syndicated TV. So they're taking me around. I, run my, I go to a place called Manhattan Proper, which was in Queens. It was literally 20 minutes from where I grew up, right? They didn't just boo me off stage. <laughs> they booed my ass out of the club onto the sidewalk. You know what I mean? Because I'm trying to do this. TV clean set in a Def Jam room. <laughs> you know, oh, it was my bro it's my brother's favorite story because he knows <laughs> of it, he knows everything. So uh, now you get to the to the um, get to the Apollo, and what they do is they'd have a rapper or music and then a comic. That was mm -hmm. the layout of the show. Yeah. So we're downstairs, and people, this is to your listeners. You guys know this. The Apollo is tiny. The Apollo is not near as big as it appears on TV. So mm -hmm. down to this green room, you're basically in the basement of a theater, not knowing who's next, right? And they just, all they told us was, they, look, you got 30 seconds. If they ain't laughing in 30 seconds, then, you know, you're done, right? <laughs> so they call me, Lonzo, you're up next. Now I'm, I'm like, I don't, buy. but I got my, and I never forget my opening joke. I went up there, I said, man, I was born in New York. I live in L.A. If I was a rapper, I have to shoot myself. <laughs> I was like, they love me. And then <laughs> but yeah, New York, New York ain't no joke, man. New York is tough, but in a good way, because if they like you, they'll give it up. And the other great thing about New York, you can say anything in New York, right? You can't offend New Yorkers. Like, that's where L.A., you know, when they're too hip to laugh or they're, or they're oh. oh, my God, yeah. you can't say that. Like in New York, they're like, bring it, bring it. If it's yeah. funny, we, we're with you. And if it ain't funny, we're going to let you know. You know, so well, I like that. You, you know, when you talk about New York and, and then, Johnny, you can jump in. I, I, just wanna, I just want to piggyback on his thing after. Just uh, the moans and the groaning and all that other stuff. Yeah. So it, it's New York was one of those places when we were coming up that, you know, we would heard you can do 10 spots in a night and, and all these, you know, mythological <laughs> stories about New York. And but but I think the fact that they did have more outlets and a lot of comics seemed to develop quickly. You did want to go to New York and prove that you can, you know, perform on that level and get the respect of those comics, you know, because a lot of people listening probably don't understand, like, what's the big deal about New York? I think LA is, is a great place to come when you're already seasoned and polished and, and ready for prime time. But if you're really trying to work and become a good comic, uh, New York is a great place because there's just so many different venues from clubs to one-nighters where you can actually go on and perform. So to go out there 
and the dynamic of the city, the personality. When you go out there and you rip in New York, you feel like, okay, like the old adage, if you could make it there, you can make it anywhere. You know, yep. you kind of feel like that uh, comedically. Go ahead, Johnny. Um, you were talking shoot. about the moans and the groans. Oh, yeah. Because Ruben and I, we, we would, the la what, last two years, Ruben? Three, mm -hmm. two years, probably really the last year, we would just talk to each other going, we are getting so annoyed and frustrated with hearing, oh, 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 don't go there. Or, you know, it, it's like the sensitivity level had had just had, had risen so high. And I don't know, like you said, if it's an L.A. thing, but I mean, we would hear it on the road a little bit, too, but just that freedom of you know being able to say whatever you want you know Lonzo and 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 then and then hearing the oh oh things like that like you know hey I don't like what he's talking about it's amazing it, how much that started to it, happen in the last year or two man like it just it, it drives me crazy man you know I'll say it on stage laugh yeah, or don't laugh we'd have to address it yeah. laugh or don't laugh I don't need your moans you know, that's not even a, a, a natural reaction. Either laugh or don't laugh. Just keep it moving. I don't need your your, well, your, your noise yeah. commentary. I mean, what you're saying, Johnny, <laughs> you know, society changes, right? So you got to go. Sometimes it's fun to go hard and make them uncomfortable. Yes. Especially when they laugh in the end because they didn't want to, but they did. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. but, but the other thing is, like, like I was watching... What was it? Weird Science. Remember that movie from the 80s? Oh, Weird Science. Yes. It was on the other night. So and there was a scene where he called the people at this party a bunch of faggots. <laughs> right? Like, and you're like, you well, you can't do that now. Like, you can't write that into a script now. But back then, that's what you could say, you know. So so it does change. Yeah, new LA people, you know, they can be, they can be, especially younger ones. There, it's almost like you're so politically correct. Like uh, Bill Maher said something that I loved. He said, you can't be more offended than the group being talked about, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. like, you can't sit here and be more offended about the Mexican joke than the Mexican guy sitting there. If he's yeah. okay with it, then you have to be okay with it. And so, and you know, or, or whatever, right? And, and that's just the way it is, but I but I always maintain this, and I still maintain this to be true. The audience knows. The audience yeah. knows if you're joking or if you mean it. Yeah. Johnny and I have done a hundred shows <laughs> back to back that it's going to open with black and Mexican jokes about the guy who was just on stage. Yeah, and they never the I audience was bring that up. Yeah, yeah, but the audience has never been offended because they know Johnny and I love each other. They know yeah. that, that it comes from a place of these two guys have been fucking with each other for 20 years. You know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? That's the that's the difference. And and as and the audience picks up on that and they're okay with it. Yeah. You know? And 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 also, and Ruben, you know, you and I would go through the same thing. You were before me, you would do your yeah. Mexican stuff. I would always see it, and I would always make sure Alonzo was there. I could see him walk in to the Long, <laughs> Long Beach lab. I could see him in the back walking. I go, all right, so he's on time. He's next. I am going to now proceed with my black material. <laughs> so I knew what was coming, and I remember some people sometimes would come up to me I was I, as I sat in the back, and Alonzo, one of my favorite, he would always, he'd go, he wouldn't always, but one of the times he went up and he went, well, I had a whole bunch of other shit I was going to talk about. But since we had this little Mexican doing black material, I'm going to go ahead and go this way. But the one, one, is, the one that had me, was when you said, when I pull up to the valet and step out to the Mexican valet guys, it's just they're confused. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody in Long Beach rolled. And I remember every now and then people would walk by to go to the restroom and they'd see me and they'd go, hey, you were great. Uh, are you like, are you okay with that? Like, oh, yes. <laughs> we have been, uh, or, and vice versa. Alonzo would do some Mexican shit and I'd go up and I'd go, well, you know what? It's my turn. And the audience would be, oh, Ruben, you and I, same thing. 
But you right, Alonzo, they always knew that we knew each other or we, we said, hey, man, I love that guy. At the end. You know, whatever. But, it, I, I mean, I loved I, – I just always loved that dynamic where we could just go, I'm going to purposely do this material so – Alonzo or Ruben can shit on me when I get off stage. Alonzo, you, you know my favorite thing to do to Johnny is? Is almost like every other set, don't do any Mexican material. Then when he comes up and shits on me, he be like, yo, that kind of fell flat. It's like, yeah, I didn't I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. Oh, but it goes reverse, remember? Because I would purposely not do black shit. And then Ruben wasn't in the room and he's like, Sanchez talking that <laughs> shit about black people, and it would be just silent. And then I first go, "Did you do your blood?" He goes, "No, motherfucker, I did not." No, nah, you got that from me because I was doing that to you oh, first. Man, <laughs> I'm that to you. The thing I love, and I used, I used to bug Johnny to do this bit long after he was tired of doing it. Remember, you used to do the old black guys oh. how they talk. But I was I'm like, Johnny, you got to do the oh, and Johnny's like, I'm, I'm tired of it. Like, Johnny wouldn't even do it, but that shit would crack me up, and I would request it. <laughs> and it was so, I look back at that, Alonzo. They actually they put the Laugh Factory put that up on their webs on their website or Instagram last year. And I just by chance, I was scrolling and I, I, I saw it. I call them immediately. I go, take it down. <laughs> take that shit down. It doesn't fly anymore. Man. And, and by the way, not surprising. You know whose favorite bit that was? Jamie. Mr. Jamie Masada. Of course. He goes, buddy, buddy, please, buddy, do the skit scat, the skit scat, <laughs> of old black guy. The favorite bit, buddy, of all time. <laughs> I go, Jamie, I can't do that shit anymore, man. Like, could you imagine right now? Alonzo, if that went viral, it, but, I have no, to apologize no, to everybody. No, you wouldn't. No, you no, wouldn't. You wouldn't. No, no, really? It's oh. funny. Because it's funny, it would work. Um, oh. you, you know, the I don't know. It it's they they get it. They listen. Yeah, but I'm talking about the young cancel culture, social media. They, could you imagine young black guys and girls right now at 17, 18, no. 19, 20 going, they would my, my uncle doesn't talk like that. My yes, grandfather. They, yes, they do. That's why yeah, they do. would laugh. And, and Johnny. Their and grandfather, because their grandfather does talk like that. <laughs> yes. Because there's an old guy at the barbershop who does talk like that. And that's why they would laugh. Because and, they know that guy. And, it's, yeah. it's, and then coming from you is coming from an honest, truthful place. It's not like you're... It's not like you're doing a bit based on just, you know, what you've heard. Like it comes from some experience. And, and remember, it was it was a lot of it. Yeah, a lot yeah. of it were were my dad's friends from high school, from the fifties. Yeah. Yeah. It's really so where that developed from. Yeah, it's well, not like you're making up a character. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's real, and and that honestly. That's part of the difference, you know? Yeah. Um, it's real. And and again, people know that when you make fun of people in a certain group, people know whether you know someone in that group, like, yeah. like the white guy acting black, right? Mm -hmm. You know when that's an act and you know when it's a white guy who actually grew up around black people. Absolutely. Yes. Two different yes. things. Because when it's a white guy who grew up around black people, he knows he was he was it's specific to the odd one, but he could do it. Like Mitch, Mitch, uh, remember Mitch Mullaney from oh, Oakland? Of course, of course. absolutely. You know Mitch grew up in Oakland. Yep. <laughs> you know, he, yeah, yeah. You, you knew he was from Oakland. A, yeah, a classic, man. a classic Mitch Mullaney story is he was doing the black comedy competition. Think about that. He was doing the black yeah. comedy competition in Oakland, and he got heck, heckled by. Uh, a black chick in the audience, and he was like, "Bitch, I'm from Oakland." And then he fucking, <laughs> just fucking came down because one thing that I appreciate about Mitch, and it, it, it just speaks to what we're talking about, it is authenticity. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You know it's authentic, and when people know it comes from a real place, just like if Alonzo does a white guy, or I do a white guy. I have I've had white people come up to me and goes, 
you really grew up around white people or you know a lot of white people and go, yeah. And they're like, okay, because it doesn't sound like you're doing just the normal white guy voice. Yeah. No, that's right. actually my friend Dan Dixon, who I'm making fun of. That's <laughs> what I went over on things. Dan Dixon. Dan Dixon. Shout out Dan Dixon. If you, I love you, dude, uh, uh, if you're listening. But yeah, uh, that, was, that was my boy, man. You know what's funny that you say that about Oakland? I used to do this. This was a bit back before about getting, um, I think it was buying uh, accessories for technology. It was it had to do with technology. And that the, the, the guy who is a trench coat is opening up his coat. And he's like, yeah, I got what you, I, I got what you need, mom. I'm like, what you need over here? I got this. I got... And then I would stop. After I was done with the bit, I would always say, and no, that's not a black guy. The dealer's not black. That's a white dude from Oakland. Because I had a cousin of mine who grew up near Oakland, and he was that he was our he was our first black relative, but he was Mexican, but he just talked like a black dude. He was around all black people. So mm -hmm. I agree. And I'm gonna off when we get off this, because we I, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna do it while we're here, uh, you know, with people listening. But I remember Alonzo and Ruben, you're gonna love this. Alonzo sent me a text. This was when the Long Beach Laugh Factor had first, it had not been open very long. And he just goes, yo, dude, I am watching the most racist white comic on stage right now. <laughs> I don't know who this dude is, but do you know a guy named, and he said it to me, and I'll tell you, I can't do it here because it's, you know. Oh, man, I got to hear this. I got to hear, hear it. Here's my he doesn't even remember. He just goes, this dude is doing all of the most stereotypical shit, and you know he didn't know any of these people. Hey, here, here's another, here, here's the, my last Alonzo story. I, I have plenty. But oh. so, <laughs> so, remember when we were at the Long Beach Laugh Factory and that person had a seizure or something in the audience? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was hosting that night, and that to me is a sign of a pro when something like that happens and disrupts the whole show. I mean, they had to call an ambulance. They had to take her out the whole nine. And I just remember Zoe, what, what young comics, you should should pay attention to this, is you kind of just let everything happen and, and just reset. You kind of went quiet for a minute and kind of let everything happen. And then as soon, and I, I as a comic, I know what you were doing, but as soon as they cleaned them out the room, man, you had like four or five jokes back to back to back to back to bring well, the room back to normal, you know? And here's the thing. And this is the thing about working so much and being on stage all the time. That wasn't my first seizure. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't my first I was featuring for Mencia, right? Oh. And it was at the Brea Improv, the old Brea Improv, and somebody had a seizure. And I'm talking fall off the stool, foaming in the mouth, bring in the ambulance, take them out. Mm -hmm. And they threw me back on stage. They were like, you got to go back. To, and I did this whole yeah. thing about how far somebody will go to not pay their bill. You know? Hey! <laughs> so that was pre-recorded? I, I thought you were a genius. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was like, you know, listen, you know it. You work so much. You've been everywhere. You got somewhere in the back of the Rolodex. You're like, Okay, seizure in audience. Got it. And you hit the Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. I was watching Alonzo. I had my mouth open. I was like, this motherfucker's a genius. No, it still counts because the first time it still counts. Ready, I wasn't, you know. But here's the thing, Ruben. I'll tell you what I talked to about oh, that. So the trip. We talked about him earlier. Bob Zaney, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Bob Zaney is, where are you from? What do you do? Blah, blah, blah. And I was talking to him about it one time, and this is a long time ago. And he says, man, when you've been doing it as long as me, there's no job I haven't heard, yeah. right? There's no, you know, you're, you're on stage five times a week asking people what they do from coast to coast. They're not going to hit you with a job that you haven't heard of. So he's ready because, Absolutely. you know, that's where yeah. new comics get in trouble, right? Because they watch us do this, but mm -hmm. we have the foundation of an act. Absolutely. And they don't have an act and they don't have any experience. 
and then somebody in the audience says something and they're like, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I, 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 I. <laughs> I, I, I think for us, it's like watching a magician work. Like they don't realize that we've, we've been prepped for this. Like I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, messing with you, but I'm not surprised that you were prepared for a situation like that. It was just yeah. fun to watch in that extreme type of situation when everybody's panicking. I mean, I've had fights break out in shows and then have to finish a set. I've had racist, racial slurs being said in a room and had to finish the set and still have to be funny during these things. And it's just a testament to, you know, your experience and being a good comic and, and not panicking. Man, you, you know, I remember, I remember being at Tortillas. Yes. And, <laughs> that says it all. That and to the, to the audience, to the right audience, there. just so you know, audience, Tortillas was a, a Mexican bar. I think it was yeah. in Montebello or something. Montebello. Like that. It was in Montebello. And the, the <laughs> chairs would be right up to the stage. Like the stage was a block on the dance floor. These two girls started fighting when Rudy was up, and Rudy started announcing the fight. <laughs> <laughs> Rudy just turned into the fight. And I, oh, oh, <laughs> Plaid dress got black dress by the hair. She slammed <laughs> the oh, We were dying. Rudy just shifted the fight announcer, and they didn't break up the fight. They let the two girls fight because it was rolling right in front of the stage. But that's yeah. how they did it, right? You had to. And, yeah. and again, so, so this is a discussion we had at um, back when I did Last Comic because they were talking about which is a better way to come up because Bonnie and Gary – had come up in the supportive, artistic, creative comic atmosphere, right? And then like me and Corey and Kathleen and Hef, we came up in the trenches, right? Doing, you know, Tuesday night at a biker bar and shit like that and, and tortillas and all of that. <laughs> but that gets you ready. You, yeah. you never learn to handle that if you're only doing A rooms. You have to do weeknights at a bowling alley to get ready for anything, right? You mm -hmm. have to do, those are the gigs that really, so now once you've done those and we did it, after doing that for five years, when you go up Saturday night at the Laugh Factory, you're like, this is too easy. This too don't easy. even count. There's and, no one here who hates me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and though even- Drunk. There's even, nothing. <laughs> even at one o'clock in the morning, you know what I mean? We didn't sprint. We didn't yeah. flinch because we'd done all these shitty gigs where the te the basketball game is on while you're performing. <laughs> you're playing music. You can hear music while you're performing. Like all these different scenarios. Um, you the best the best music gig, okay? When it's the hotel ballroom or the club that has dancing after the show, so they're there for the dancing, dancing. and you're just in the way like that. Like dancing starts at ten. And it's nine thirty. Collect Gemini. <laughs> you're like, man, this place is packed, and it's I like, yeah, but it has nothing to do. You're in the way of why. It's <laughs> hey, hey, Lonzo. Hey, hey, Lonzo, Johnny, San Manuel Casino. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then the other one. Uh, what was that? Ho Ho Hoboba? No. Uh, remember that gig way out? Hoboba. It oh, was Saboba. Saboba Saboba. Casino. Anyway. Yeah. Let, let me get, a, I just want to get on a point about, uh, Alonzo brought up a great point about uh, being able to do the crowd work and, and stuff. I don't know about you, Alonzo. Uh, this is something that I've always told Ruben that I respect about both of you guys is, yeah, you guys are great at crowd work, but it's not something you guys are looking for. No. You guys would no. rather go up and have a point of view and you have something to say, and then things happen, and then you guys roll right into the crowd work. I've always like Ruben and I. I feel like the comics nowadays are they see they see us do crowd work, and they mm -hmm. go, "Man, I got to start doing that." I'm like, "Yo, dude, you're three years in. Yeah. Just focus on the material right now. Hecklers will be hecklers, and drunks will be drunks. But you're gonna you you need to develop who you are. They're so." quick to the crowd work now that they have yeah. no foundation. They have no, and then every time they get called for a set, they're in a complete panic. Yeah. Oh man, I, I got to do something. I got to come up with five minutes, but it, it has to be clean or it has yeah. to be strong or it has, 
And I go, yeah, you've been spending three years of your past six doing crowd work when you don't really necessarily need to do it. I, I, Ruben and I have had this conversation. Alonzo, I didn't even – I mean, if, if called upon, I would deal with people. But I honestly did not really work on my crowd work until my 10th year. Well, well, I just did stand-up. I was like, I'm going to just do material. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, you guys know at Dublin's, I used to do nothing but, right? That was just sure. my fun. Sure. Like, mining for material and this and that. So when I saw Todd Barry do a special, like do a whole tour of nothing but crowd work, I was like, wait, we're allowed to do that? Yeah. <laughs> like, damn. Yeah. I could and no again, no disrespect to Todd, because I know yeah. Todd. I love Todd. Yeah. But but yeah, crowd work was always what you do in between material or whatever. It wasn't the the end of, it wasn't the end result. It was just yeah. something that took place. And then for now, for a lot of people, it has become the end result and good for them. But yeah, Johnny, that that when I teach new comics, teach new comics. When I talk to new <laughs> comics, um Freudian slip, yes. I always tell them, no, I always tell them you gotta have an act. That you have have an act, man. your act is the backbone because I said because what okay. happened when someone in the crowd doesn't say something or you don't have anything to go, like how do you get back to funny if you don't have anything? You're depending on them. Well, you know, oh, go ahead. you know what's interesting is you bring up Dublin's. You're the one who got me into Dublin's. You called me up, <laughs> I'll never forget this. You wow. called me up and was like, hey, I gave this guy named Jay Davis your number I I usually you said I usually close the show and they need a closer and I recommended you and Jay called me and he was like hey man I uh, got your uh, number from Alonzo Bowden man uh, we need a closer he usually closes the show but he's out of town or something I was like yeah I can do it so I would always fill in for Alonzo when he couldn't do it but I wasn't doing crowd work back then so I felt so much pressure to always have new material when I had to replace him. This dude is going up just ripping the roof doing crowd work. And I'm like, man, I'm just trying to come up, you know, with a new tin, you know, to, to get through this set. But yeah, you're the one who introduced me. And then, uh, shit, I'll say it, even though I probably shouldn't say this publicly. I remember when, uh, when me and Zoe were talking and I was like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, you're not getting paid? And I was like, you getting paid? And you're like, hell yeah, I'm getting paid. You think I'm coming down here to close this show for free? <laughs> yeah, I was getting paid. I was getting 20 bucks a night. <laughs> but after bucks. that, I started getting 20 bucks a night yeah. because I was like, hey, man, you paying Alonzo, you not paying me? <laughs> 20 bucks and a free burger. Exactly, but, uh, exactly. You know, what I loved about that, that will always be the most creative place I ever was. Because, yeah, it was because it started out as an open mic. And I always looked at it as this is somewhere I like I called it mining. I would look for material. I do 15 minutes of crowd work looking for something I could take from that and work and, and be material to the point where when I did last comic, there were people from Dublin's who were like, I didn't know you could do regular comedy like they had never seen me stand up and do a set. They always saw me sitting on a, on a stool mm -hmm. asking what happened this week, where you've been, hit, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But it was such a creative space, man. I love that part of comedy, that creativity of doing something new. That's another thing that's weird now, right? Mm -hmm. There's no workout space in Zoom. Yeah. Like everything you do, you're just doing it for the first time thinking it's going to work or it ain't, you know, where the, it's based on history. Like this should be funny. We don't have that workout anymore. There's nowhere to work new material. Uh, Alonzo, yeah. I'm curious, did you do uh, the Laugh Factory stream with no audience? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did it a couple of times. You did do, okay. So you did do it. I only did it once. And, um, you know, I told Rube it, it, it took me about five or so minutes to, to realize that I don't I didn't need to pause. Uh, there was no need to wait for anything. And once I got into that, I was fine with it. Now, Ruben knows this. I'm not the biggest fan of people in general anyway. And I've always felt like the mm -hmm. first row should be, especially at the Long Beach Laugh Factory, that first row, those people sitting around the stage. 
I've wanted them to get rid of that since it opened. I don't like people looking up at me eating. And those are always the people that were disruptive. And of course, you know, Ruben, I, I don't get upset on stage at audience members. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm like Gabriel. I mean, I'm the sweetest. They love me. Anyway. No, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it's really weird, Alonzo, because I told Ruben, I go, man, maybe, I don't know if it's just as me going on in years or getting older that the audiences were really, really starting to frustrate me and irritate me to where I wasn't having a good time. And I kind of look at this like when I did the streaming, yeah, it was brutal to not have an audience there at first. But once I got in the groove of going, oh, I just mow down, I just keep going. I was okay with it. And I feel like I actually enjoy this right here. This. Whoa. I'd love to be around you guys, but I, I like this. Wow. First not of all, Johnny, let me say that, yeah, it's you. <laughs> that was that. 100. 100%. <laughs> it's, it's, it's you, man. Well, well, well I mean, the we other thing, the, just yeah. real quick on the, yeah. you know why the streaming thing at the Laugh Factory was easy? Because I've been on that stage so much. I was acting like there was an audience. You know what I mean? Like that place is so at home. Yes. It was it, it's very easy to go on that stage in yeah. an empty room and do 20 minutes right. because right. It, I'm so used to that stage. It's mm -hmm. so home. You know, when I go on the road, when whatever, when I came back, when I never walked into the factory and it didn't feel like home. Like yeah. that exhale when you hit the stage, like, ah, this is my spot. I can do anything I want here. Yeah, you know, it's a yeah. great feeling. So, so did you know that? I'm sorry, Rube. I, I know you're gonna let him go, but did you know that they've added since then? They've added, um, which I went up with an app that had fake audience laughter and booze because I just felt like I should do it. They're doing pan laughs now. I don't know if you know that or not. I haven't done it in a while. I didn't even know they'd started doing it again. Are they doing it again? Then, or? They were doing it, but how would you feel about going up and, and then hearing a panned audience like a, like a baseball no, game? Or I, my favorite ones were when Craig was playing the keyboards and you mm -hmm. could, I could joke back and forth with Craig. Yeah, that, was, that worked so great with Craig. Yeah. yeah. That, what, what, that, kind of, what they're actually doing is they're taking shows that were recorded and then they're adding in the laughter and the stuff, which I'm not a, I'm not a fan of that. I think you just you know, Ruben. You, oh, you, wait a minute! I thought they were doing them live at with 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 the speaker. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, okay. No. Gotcha. Ruben, as a basketball fan, and we didn't even have a chance to get to sports, oh, but we got to have you back on, man. Yeah, yeah we need I'd, to I'd be happy to. But it's like watching a game. Like the I've watched the baseball games where they put in the audience. Oh. Yeah. The sound. It works in baseball because baseball, like one team is the home team, you're the away team. It, it doesn't work with basketball because the game's too fast. And yeah. you can't, you, you know what I mean? You can't yeah. tell like who they're rooting for, you know? Uh, so with, with us, man, leave us alone. Let us do it. The other thing is, you know, this is, you talk about a test. Are you a comic? Yeah, go up there with no audience. Go up there. No audience and do now. Let's find out what you got. <laughs> and, and, and that's right, Alonzo, because there is no crowd work. You that's can't right. Crowd work. And uh, Jamie wanted me to do thirty-five. This was I did it the the second week. Mm -hmm. I let the first couple days go by, and I did the second week. He wanted me to do thirty-five. I did twenty-eight, and I, it still felt like an hour and a half. I mean, yeah. that was really really long. So. Um, yeah. Like you, I think it's just for, for all of us, it's uh, adapting to this yeah. new way of life right now for however long we got to do it because we're comics. We're going to look for an outlet to perform. Um, but let's hope it gets back to normal or whatever the new normal is sooner yeah, than later. Even better, guys. Guess who's bringing back Skit Scat? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Lonzo, b before we get out... Uh, <laughs> Tell people some of the dates you have coming up and um, where they can find you on social media, et cetera. So um, I use my name, Alonzo Bowden, B-O-D-D-E-N.com. And it's the same on um, Facebook and Twitter. So funny on Instagram. Recently, somebody has like uh, made those dummy accounts. Like there's Alonzo Bowden one. There's so yeah. funny. 
I don't know what they hope to achieve. But <laughs> it's like go ahead. I don't. But so we're trying to get rid of those. Um, live. It, listen, if you're in Tampa, I'm going to be in Tampa August 13th through 16th. And I'm going to be in St. Louis, August 20th through 22nd. So if you're in either one of those cities, just come help half fill the room and we'll have a good time. And hey, uh, yeah. no, more, no, no more comics can't brag about sellout rooms anymore. No. Uh, <laughs> but, or half sellouts. They could, listen, I, I just want to tell everybody uh, who's watching or listening, uh, I can guarantee you this with a hundred percent is something that you, it's, it's a number you it's rarely used. You shouldn't almost nothing is a hundred percent, but I know Ruby can agree with me on one thing. You go see Alonzo Bowden. You will be 100% satisfied. I'm guaranteeing that I'm guaranteeing that or Ruben will pay you back your money. <laughs> no, I mean, Alonzo is just, it, He's not going to cheat you when you go see him. There's some guys that you you go see and they're not consistent, but Zoe always has something to say, always has fresh material, and he's so, a, good, a good human being. So um, well, if you're you guys, example, and, you, and you guys are the same way in this. This this is what I'll say, and this applies to you. We don't cheat the art. No. See, that's what it is. We don't cheat the art. It is, you know. Some people are in it for whatever other reason, but but if you love stand up, you love the creativity, you love the art of what we and I'm and I'm not one of those sitting back. I'm an artist and I'm creating and all. No, but but we do know what it is and we love doing it. So that's why our shows. You're always going to get everything we got. We're we're going to give you everything we got. Well, Zo, stay safe out there, brother, and uh, I can't wait till we can. Uh connect again. Uh, I got to come see the, the the new crib that you've been <laughs> money into. <laughs> and Ruben, on the topic of sports, I will say this. Even if the Clippers win, I don't consider this year an NBA championship. This well, if, if the Lakers win, I am considering it an NBA championship. Ah, come on. <laughs> you know what would know be great? If the asterisk looks like the coronavirus uh <laughs> <laughs> they gotta make a little uh, that would be hilarious but hey everybody follow and support Alonzo Bolton Zoe love you brother thank you for doing the show man I can't wait to have you back on you have that. Um, go see Zoe um, in uh, Tampa or in St. Louis and uh, follow him he's on NPR and he has a podcast called um, what's the name who's of the podcast paying who's paying, who's attention? paying attention on all things comedy and yeah and yeah, wherever uh, podcasts are sold. Wherever <laughs> podcasts are sold. And once again, uh, thank you to everybody who who listens uh, to the show and watches the show. Uh, please share. Please tell a friend. We're on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you can get YouTube. podcasts. Yeah, wherever, YouTube. wherever. Yeah, yeah. So thank you guys, and um, that is the end of end of our show. So once again, man, appreciate you, brother, and uh, we are. Out. Ruby Mother and Tuesdays. This show is all about diversity and bringing everyone together. Yeah, we'll be too, so that's right.